So here's the section I want to cover today with you. And uh, there's only a set of slides so far, but there will also be uh, two GitHub repos, although really only one of them is only a really important to us, really, that I will make available to you. And you're going to spend quite a while, I'd say, just poking around that repo. And you will be using it as uh, you'll be using it in the assignment Frank mentioned, uh, I think, in a Slack message there last week that I would be <laughs> stroke helping you with the assignment. Really, it's the one part of the assignment that I want to focus on uh, today. And it is that part concerning the integration of front end and back end. That's really the purpose of this lecture. So um, I'm going to go walk through these slides. There aren't many slides there. So most of today's lecture is going to be looking at code from one of that those GitHub repos that I mentioned. So the lecture is going to be, um, well, I'll try and have it as structured as possible, but it may be slightly unstructured, which might mean that you will have to re-watch this video and you know, fast forward and et cetera, et cetera, to get to bits of it that are relevant to the assignment, depending on what part of the assignment you're working on. That's kind of my thinking anyway, in terms of when I when I prepared this lecture. So let's start with the slides anyway. Uh, so this is kind of uh, what I'd like to get through, and I've kind of alluded to it uh, there a few minutes ago. It's really all about how do we, uh, there's two things really, how do we, or can we deploy our front end, our React app, can we deploy that to the AWS platform? And the answer is yes, we can. We can deploy it to other platforms as well, but uh, we, we're just focusing on AWS. And there's two services that we use to facilitate that. The S3 service, which you're familiar with from not this module, but the previous module. And also a service called CloudWatch, sorry, CloudFront, uh, which you probably would not have covered in the um, Cloud Architecture module, those of you that did it. So that will be new. And so we'll have to look at, uh, we're, we're back in the world of CDK now again. We're going to have to look at how we write our infrastructure code using S3 and CloudFront to deploy our front end onto the AWS platform. Uh, that's And then once we deploy the front end, how can we uh, integrate our deployed front end with our deployed backend. So in assignment one, we created a small backend, uh, as well as TMDB, of course. Currently, your React app, as you know, is talking to a backend, but the backend is TMDB. Uh, we ideally would like our React app to communicate with TMDB and also communicate with the API that we developed in assignment one, which means that the uh, React app needs to find the URL of the APIs. There are actually two of them, if you remember. There was the Auth API and the App API, uh, REST API, and each of those had their uh, URL. How do we get those URLs? We, we could just hard code them into the React app. That, that would work okay, but of course that means then if we, for whatever reason, destroy our backend and recreate it, they've got new URLs. So we've got to go back into the React code and uh, we hard code them. So hard coding is never a good idea, really, in any aspect of software development. So ideally, we'd like when we deploy our front end to dynamically pick up the back end's uh, URL. Uh, and we'll see how to do that, to do it dynamically. And there's a standard, there are probably a couple of ways of doing it, but there's a pattern, a simple enough pattern, as it turns out, that I've come across in a couple of actors. So we'll see how to achieve that. Um, also, uh, maybe we'd like our 
our app to become world famous. So we'd like to have a nice URL or domain name associated with our React app. And so can we actually, could we possibly come up with a, assign a custom domain name to our, our full stack app? I should really be referring to it as, as a full stack now because we've got both a front end and back end deployed onto Amazon. But you know when we de when we deploy our front end to S three, uh, and even using CloudFront, you know it's going to have a an auto generated URL, and it's not going to be a very nice URL. It's going to be some sort of a hash value, dot CloudWatch dot AWS etc. Something like that. We'd like to give it a custom domain name. Uh, so how would we actually do that? And just to illustrate that last point, for example. I switch over to the browser and if I open up a tab and if I go movies so the URL there is movies.dermotoconnor.com so I've uh, registered the dermotoconnor.com domain name for myself and the subdomain of that I've defined as being movies.dermotoconnor.com and if I hit return, and that's, you know, okay, dermotoconnor.com is not great maybe, but uh, it's a custom domain name anyway. And I get my my app, my, re, uh, my movies app. And I can tell you as well, although there's nothing obvious from looking at the screen there, because all we're seeing there is all the stuff that it gets from TMDB. But if I open up the console, then I can tell you that behind the scenes, my movies app is actually, as well as communicating with TMDB, it's also communicating with the um, with a backend that I've deployed to AWS, uh, to API Gateway, really, right? And uh, that's evidence. You can forget about this little thing here for a second. That's evidenced to me anyway, uh, and you'll see later on by virtue of these two things here. So. I, I in this part here, I'm doing a console log, having having sent a request to the app API that I have deployed to Amazon. I've sent it a get request, and the lambda that actually runs at the back end eventually that's uh, that's triggered from API Gateway. That lambda just returns a simple little uh, kind of confirmation message, which is this here, right? Um, the Lambda, I can actually just, I know I'm jumping around the place a little bit now, but uh, if I can show you the actual Lambda that generated that response, can I? Oh yeah, over here. Uh, let's see. The Lambda is this one here. Okay, and so all that Lambda does is it just returns this simple little success message, yeah, uh, message success. And that's what I got. Uh, that's what I got there. Right, so that's proving to me that my React app is communicating with my app backend. This part here is proving to me that my React app which is deployed onto Amazon is also communicating with my auth backend uh, because I have actually asked it. I've actually tried to do a login and it's sending me back a JWT token and there's the JWT token there. So as I said, that's proven to me that it works, but I need to show you this code, obviously. Um, Okay, um, but that, that's a long way down the line. So, so, so the point there is I have a custom domain name linked to my movies app, uh, which is deployed onto uh, AWS. And also that movies app is communicating with a backend that is deployed onto AWS as evidenced by the stuff here, this console logging here. So that would be the ultimate aim. Um, I'm not sure whether you will be able to get that far, though. Not, not being disrespectful, to you know, but uh, there's a long, a lot that would need to be done to get to that um, endpoint. But we can let it be an objective.
close that off. Okay, back to my slides though. Um, first of all, let's go way back to here though and talk about building a React app. So what does building a React app mean? Let's go back to VS Code. Uh, what I'm showing you here is the React app that she have been developing in the labs, and it's pretty up to date. I think it might be missing the last part. So you you know you're you're familiar with uh, everything that's going on here. Uh, the various uh, let's see, sorry, I want to oh yeah, I have my components folder, et cetera, et cetera. So you're familiar with all of that. And what you do, what you have been doing up to now in the labs, is if we look at the bottom right hand corner of my screen, maybe I'll make this a little bit smaller so that it gets into what you see. Uh, what you do down here is uh, npm run dev. And what that does behind the scenes is it starts up a development server provided by the Vite tool. Uh, it runs that server and it um, it provides us with a URL. And if we go to that URL, it's localhost, then we get our React app running on a local server. Uh, and that's fine. And, and we know that if we go back to our code and we make changes to our code, then the development server will... Uh, perform what's called a hot module replacement. It will essentially up, upload the changes that you have made, the relevant modules that you have made changes to. It will upload those modules to the browser. So we get that kind of live reloading effect. And that's brilliant when you're doing development. Okay, so it's a very good developer experience. But this isn't going to work, obviously, in production. How do I actually deploy my App, this React application onto the cloud. Um, I can't be using this kind of development server that does hot module replacement and live reloading and all of that stuff. That's far too, um, introduces latency, et cetera. So what I've got to do is I've got to create or build a production version of our app. What we're seeing here on the left is our source code and it's what we see at development stage. But we can't be uploading all of these individual files, obviously. Anyway, they're in TypeScript, so uh, that's no good. We need to convert them to JavaScript. We're not going to be uploading each of these files, individual files, uploading them to our um, deployment platform. Uh, that's not going to scale either, really. What we need to do is to to build or create a static or production version of our React app. And fortunately, the Vite tool does that for us. So if I, from the command line, and you may have done this at the very beginning with Frank, I didn't get a chance to ask him whether he, he had shown you or not, but if he have, you've only done it once. So, but it's uh, it probably, is in the back of your mind at some stage, but you've forgotten about it. So the command is npm run build. And if we look at package.json, build is, where's my package.json? Package.json. And you can see build here is again using the Vite. Uh, sorry, wrong one. Um, this one. It's it's using the Vite tool. So again, Vite is essentially what's called a bundler or builder, uh, and it comes as well with the development server. But predominantly, it's a a bundler, which means it it takes all of your source code and it bundles it into one single JavaScript file. So let's just run the script. So what it's doing now is it's gobbling up all your source code. It's converting the TypeScript to JavaScript. Uh, it's putting all of that JavaScript into a single file. 
and as well, it's taking all of the node modules that you have imported into your source code. It's taking all of the all of those node module packages and including that in the single JavaScript file and creating one bundle uh, or static version of your application. And where does it put it? Well, if you look on the left here, there is a folder called the dist folder or um, distributable, I suppose, really, something that you can distribute or deploy. And if we look inside there, all we have is we've got a single index.html file, but there's actually very little in that HTML file. Um, in fact, there's no HTML at all. Uh, it's an empty, the, the, the body of the HTML is empty. So that's not much good. But critically, uh, it has a script reference uh, here. And the script reference is referring to a JavaScript file in the assets folder. And here is my assets folder. And if I expand that, here is the JavaScript file. Uh, the name is just a, well, okay, it's prefixed with uh, index, but the rest of the name is just a hash that the V tool computes based on the content of the file. And if I open up this file, that's it, right? Now, what you are seeing here is a minified, it's, sorry, first of all, it is a JavaScript file. And this JavaScript file contains all of your source code and all of the node modules that you have imported contains all of that JavaScript. And it has minified it, meaning it has gotten rid of any indentation and alignment, got rid of any um, white space, essentially. But it is your code plus the node modules. And the way I can actually prove that, I was actually just poking around with it there earlier on. If we do a search for, let's say, movie, then, you know, you can see here we're getting uh, 36 different occurrences of movies. So <laughs> that's my way of proving to you that uh, our source code is buried inside in this file. Now, this is the thing, though. This is what we can now upload to uh, be it AWS or any other platform. This is what we can deploy. Oh, this is you know this is what we what we deploy. So what we deploy is the contents of the dist folder, and that really only consists of three files: the index.html, my bundled JavaScript file, and okay, there's another file here which is just an image file, I think. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, it's just a JPEG file, which is probably not that important. Right, uh, that's what we upload. So the next thing is, how do we upload that? Let's go back to, oh yeah, sorry. One thing I want to mention to you is that when we ran that command, uh, npm run build, as I say, what, uh, what the Vite tool does is it essentially gobbles up all of your source code, converts it, and then packages it into one um uh, uh javascript file and minifies it etc cetera, etc cetera, and brings in all of the node modules but it also performs uh linting static analysis on your code so your code cannot have any linting errors clearly it won't have any kind of um compilation errors typescript compilation errors but you're not allowed to have any linting errors either uh, and so what I just to prove to you what I mean by that is if I just go into any file at all, if I just pick any file and what I'll do is I'm going to create a variable. I'll go const. Who equals 10. That's fine. Uh, and, but I'm not using this variable anywhere. Now, from a linting point of view, a linter would complain telling you that, look, you've got a variable that's unused. And really, um, when we're doing bundling of our app into a single JavaScript file, 
clearly we, we want it to be as small as possible because that file is what's going to be downloaded from our deployment platform to the browser of our user. And the smaller we can make it, the better. Not that this is going to add a whole lot to it. But either way, um, from a linting point of view, we don't really need that line of code. Now, if I leave it there, though, and it's not a, as I said, it's not a compilation error because I'm not getting any, I'm not getting any complaints here from the TypeScript compiler. Yeah. Um, don't worry about that one. That's so, mm -mm. it has actually picked it up. Sorry, I've just made a, uh, okay. The, okay. The TypeScript compiler has picked it up. Uh, so I'm thinking back to my JavaScript days, but. Um, if we, I'll, I'll leave it there anyway. If we try and do a build, though, there are there are cases where linting errors won't show up as compilation errors. That I happen to pick the wrong one now, but uh, sorry, what's happening here? The terminal doesn't want to open for some reason. Okay. If I try and do a build, then it it won't complete the build. It's and it's telling me about there now. Like I said, unfortunately, this is actually also being shown up by the TypeScript compiler. But there can be cases when the TypeScript compiler won't show any problems, uh, but the builder will identify linting problems, and it's a bit. It can be a little bit frustrating in that it just won't let you. Uh, it won't ignore those. There, there, it is may, there may be possible ways of configuring the Vite tool to ignore certain types of linting errors, uh, but you'd have to go looking that up. But I, I guess it's better just to fix the linting errors so that you get a clean, uh, a clean build. And again, so if I take this out now, uh, the build will work. So you always have to keep an eye that the build did actually complete successfully, I guess is what I'm trying to get out there. Okay. So how do I deploy my, uh, I would, we would refer to this now as the, the production or static version of our react app. And if I go back to my slides, uh, I'm talking about a dynamic versus a static version of your react app, what you've been working with up to now is what we would kind of classify as a dynamic version of your app in that whenever you make changes, you know, those changes are pushed to the browser by the Vite development server. We're also contrasting the development environment, which is what you've been using up to now versus the production environment, which is what I've just shown you. Next thing we want to do though, is move on to uh, front end app deployment. And I've already indicated that the services that we use are S3 and CloudFront. Uh, let's just use S3 first because you, you don't have to use CloudFront. There is a reason why you would want to use CloudFront with S3. You can just use S3 on its own. So how do I, from a CDK point of view, we're moving into the CDK world now. How do I uh, automate the provisioning of an S3 bucket and upload my static version of my React app to that bucket. How do I uh, provision all of that from a CDK point of view? So if we switch over to uh, this, so here's our familiar CDK project structure. And here's the CDK file. This is pretty straightforward now. Uh, I can tell you before we actually work our way through it, there are, there are really only two entries in my in my CDK file. First of all, I'm creating an S3 bucket here. Uh, just some properties. Uh, I do have to make the bucket public read accessible. 
which isn't great, which means that anybody could potentially poke around the bucket, but uh, the rest is got to do with, uh, so this is obviously, you know, when I destroy my stack to try to bucket, that's okay. Uh, there are some additional uh, auto delete. That's all right. That's just, again, a, um, what do I want to happen to individual objects to use the S3 term within the bucket? I want them to be deleted because as you know, you cannot, you cannot delete a bucket unless the bucket is empty. So here we're kind of essentially telling we're allowing uh, the CDK to, when we do a CDK destroy to first of all, delete the objects in the bucket and then delete the bucket. Uh, here's some more uh, security related stuff, which we'll kind of conveniently just skip over. We can just treat them as hard code really. This line here is important though. This line is essentially making our S3 bucket the host for now. It strictly speaking, it's a website. Okay, it's not really a website that we're developing, but uh, um, we do have an index.html. Okay, so technically that's kind of a, it's kind of a website. Uh, so by just adding this single line that I've just highlighted there, that is enabling S3 to configure our bucket as a as a, a source for a website so that we will be able to send browser requests to it and it will load the contents of the quote unquote website into our browser now the website in our case will consist of the index.html and the bundle javascript file that i was talking about there a moment ago but uh, so that's fine that's creating our bucket this entry here then is how we upload Essentially, all we're doing is all, all this does is it uploads objects to use the S3 term to a bucket. It doesn't have to be website related at all, uh, but in our case, it just happens to be a website. So uh, the uh, bucket deployment is how we upload stuff to a bucket. And here we're telling it where to find the uh, files that we want to upload and in this case it's assets files that are in a folder called in my case dot slash site now where's that folder if i look here uh i have a folder called site somewhere Or do I? Maybe I didn't actually create it at all. Maybe I, did. oh, there it is. Sorry, sorry, sorry. There it is there. There's my site folder. And really all the site folder contains is the output from the build that I did uh, on the other project there. Now, it is a bit clumsy, admittedly. What you've got to do is you've got to copy the contents into this folder kind of manually. That's not great really, admittedly, from a developer experience, but um, it'll have to do us for now. You can automate that as well, but then that would require us to go talking about something called uh, CICD pipelines with the CDK tool, and I don't want to get into that because it's far too involved. So it, that's a manual step that you have to do first. You've got to copy the contents of the dist folder into this site folder. It doesn't have to be called site, call it anything you want to, uh, but you do have to do, do that manually. And all I'm doing here then is I'm telling in my CDK again, bring back up my CDK. Uh, I am telling it, look, go to the site folder for the files that I want to have uploaded to the bucket and what bucket, telling it the bucket there. So that's pretty straightforward to involve there. When I do a CDK deploy of that stack, which I've done already, then I can flip over to, uh, sorry, when I do the deployment, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm outputting here, I'm outputting the buckets URL and the bucket will have a URL because I configured it as a website. Yeah. So I did that while I go, so the URL actually might be here. So here's the URL. And if I 
click on that. Then, yeah, I get my uh, my React app. Now, this is just my standalone React app. It's not communicating with any backend uh, because my CDK stack didn't deploy any backend and it didn't hook any backend uh, into my front end. Okay. Uh, and the URL is, you know, it's an S3 URL, kind of ugly, but that's okay. So that's the kind of 101 of how do you deploy a, a single page app? It doesn't have to be a React app because if we were using some other uh, front end technology like Vue or Angular, the, the process is the same. You have to create a static or production or build version of your single page app. And that's what you upload to, in the case of AWS, that's what you upload to your S3 bucket, which has been configured as a website. And then when you browse to the URL associated with that bucket, then uh, what is downloaded, you know, if I open up the if I open up the net, the console and click on the network tab. And if I just do a refresh, uh, what's uploaded to, sorry, what's downloaded by S3 to my browser? Well, um, that's just the the image. That's not important. This is the index.h. This is the this is the sorry, let me see. Yeah, this this is the JavaScript file that contains all of my code. Thought I should see the index.html there as well, but I don't know why I don't see that. The very first thing should be the index.html. I wonder why that didn't show. Okay, maybe the dev tool doesn't show the index.html. I thought it did, but uh, when the index.html, which as you, you can remember there was a, essentially a blank index page but it did contain a reference to the script file and the script tag in the index at HTML is what resulted in this file being downloaded, um, uploaded, sorry, uh, uh, downloaded to the browser. And then the rest really has got to do with, uh, so when this JavaScript is loaded into the browser, it executes and that's all where all the React stuff kicks in and starts building the DOM in the browser. And as we know, our React app React app is making lots of calls to TMDB. So this is the call that it makes to TMDB to get the 20 movies. And then all of the other ones here are the images because each movie has an image associated with it. And that image has to be um, sent to the browser individually. So that's what all these other network uh, calls are all about. Okay, uh, let's get back to the main topic though, which is deployment of React apps. I'll just pause for a second in case there are any questions though. I think it's pretty straightforward so far. Okay, back to my slides. So we know now about this idea of building, uh, or it's often referred to more technically as bundling a React app. Uh, we've, we've looked at deploying the front end uh, or a front end onto AWS, although we're just using S3. So that means if our React app is, you know, has a large user base, uh, all the requests from the users to load the app into their browser, they're all targeting S3. You know, so there's a single point of failure there, um, potentially. And also if for a very high volume of traffic, then latency is going to be introduced because S3 can only serve, you know, so many requests to um, serve the index.html and the JavaScript. And the JavaScript is quite a, a hefty pack, um, 
um, payload, really. So having that single point of failure and, and single source is not great, uh, which is where this other service called CloudFront comes into the picture. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, CloudFront in theory first and then apply it to our uh, Movies app. So it's the uh, Amazon CloudFront service, which is essentially a CDN, a uh, content delivery network. And just to make sure everybody is clear on what a content delivery network is, a CDN is essentially a globally distributed network of uh, servers, uh, often referred to as edge location servers. Um, edge location servers, but it's a globally distributed network of servers. And each of these servers, the other name that's often given is that they are called uh, points of presence or POPs. So a CDN is a network of POPs. And these POPs are edge location servers. What they do is they cache the contents of the, in our case, the S3 bucket. They cache them locally. And that means any users that are make a request for our React app, those requests will first of all hit the edge location server that is geographically closest to them. And if it happens to have cached the uh, content, then it will, it will serve them rather than going back to S3 to look for it. If the edge location server doesn't have them cached, then, then it does go back to S3 and request the content, which is our two files predominantly, our index.html and our bundled JavaScript file. It'll request them from S3. When it receives them from S3, it'll cache them locally and then serve it to the user. And so caching is really the main um, uh, activity um, or purpose of these edge location servers. And so what the CloudFront AWS service allows us to do is to create a network of these edge location servers. It just does it for us. We just create the necessary infrastructure code and CloudFront kind of takes care of the rest. And the edge location servers are predetermined by uh, by the CloudFront servers. We, we don't really have any control over that. So uh, when I looked at it there last week, uh, in terms of the stats, CloudFront has, according to the documentation, its own documentation anyway, uh, 400 plus points of presence, so 400 uh, nodes, edge location nodes, distributed across, what does it say, 90 cities and 47 uh, countries, 47 different countries. Yeah. So, okay, it's, it is um, classifies as a content delivery network. Uh, you can also it can also uh, help in preventing direct denial of service uh, problems, but we we won't really look into that. Okay, just a visual kind of representation. Now, in terms of creating a CDN using CloudFront, there are two resources that that's resources in the AWS sense. AWS is all about services, and you use a service to create a resource. Well, the cloud front service allows us or requires us to create two resources, an origin resource and what's called a, a distribution resource. The origin resource is really a resource that tells CloudFront where is the actual source for your content, which in our case will be S3, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, the distribution then is is kind of uh, telling it to create a CDN for us. And we have to link the distribution resource to the origin resource and configure it uh, with some other parameters as well. So it's, it's distribution is kind of an abstract idea, but it's, it's essentially, uh, it's creating the, the network, if you like, the network of uh, nodes in our, um, in our CDN. Uh, and also tells it how to tells it how to to manage uh, the 
content that it is caching. In terms of the origin, picking that uh, resource first, the origin can either be S3, which is uh, the, the predominant uh, origin that would be used really, but it, you can actually also use any type of HTTP uh, resource. So you could use API Gateway as an origin. And if you think about an API Gateway that is uh, fronting a RESTful backend, but let's say the content that that RESTful backend is serving is, is reasonably static. It's not dynamically changing every few minutes. It may change uh, a couple of times a week, but if it only changes a couple of times a week, then we would consider that to be uh, fairly static. So using CloudFront uh, as a CDN in front of an API gateway, that's also legitimate. We're not gonna look at it though. Or in front, you could use an application load balancer as an origin for a CloudFront CDN network or indeed an EC2 instance that would typically be more legacy related. If you had an EC2 instance that was running a web server that was hosting a website, a traditional website where the website was reasonably static in nature. And again, by static, I mean, you know, may only change once a day or a couple of times a week. Um, then you see, if you have a web server running on an EC2 instance that you're back to your single point of failure there, or your single point of contact for your globally distributed users that are trying to access your website. But by sticking CloudFront in front of it, then CloudFront can cache the contents that your server, that your web server is managing on the EC2 instance in the exact same way as with S3. Uh, might be a little confusing, but uh, that I'm including S3 websites here. Um, when I when we talk about S3 up here as being an origin, maybe there's one or two points actually that I missed here that I should go back to. When we talk about S3 as the origin for our CDN, then you know the the contents in the S3 bucket could be anything. It doesn't have to be a website. It doesn't have to be a web app. It could just be files. Let's say it could be image files that you're making available to. Uh, uh, your user base or any type of files, but it's just files that you want static files that aren't changing that you want to make available to a globally distributed user base. Uh, if, if that is your situation, then you upload the particular files to your S3 bucket, you stick a CloudFront CDN in front of it, and it takes care of, you know, caching those files in the various edge location uh, servers uh, in the way that I described. So it's just really kind of a, your cloud front in that case is just a sort of file um, service, file provisioning service. You can actually use cloud front as well as an ingress. In other words, uh, you, you're allowing users to upload files to your CDN. Uh, again, we won't look at that, but in that case, you know, you would be uploading it to uh, the the uh, edge location server that's closest. The, the majority of the communication would be between the edge location server that's closest to the user. Uh, so the user would, behind the scenes, be uploading the file to the edge location server, and then uh, and the edge location server would acknowledge the receipt of that file. But then behind the scenes, the edge location server would upload it to the bucket, but the user doesn't have to wait for that to happen as such. That's what we mean by an ingress. So CloudFront is not just one way. Um, you can have uploads as well as downloads. Again, this is all kind of theory so far. Let's see, we'll get into the, the uh, programming office in a second, but uh, this again, kind of a visual reputation, most of which I've kind of talked my way through at this stage, really. So our client, our edge location server, our origin, which could be anything, the requests uh, for a particular quote-unquote uh, 
uh, file. Uh, first of all, when that request, it first of all hits the education server, checks its cache, it's not there, goes to the origin, gets it, stores it in the cache, gives it back to the client. Same kind of story here, but you know, get the kind of distribution aspect to our um to our CDN. Uh, one other thing that I missed out on, sorry now, is so I said that there are two types of resources, an origin and a distribution. Uh, there is one other resource. If I just go back to here, I'm mentioning it here. Um, so let's say S3 is our origin, uh, but we obviously want to, I mean, AWS is all about security. So we want to secure that bucket. We don't want to allow uh, we certainly don't want to give public read access to that bucket. Really, the only entity that we want to allow to read from the bucket is our distribution resource. So I know if I go back to here, right? I said there are two resources, origins and, and distribution. So we only want the distribution resource to be able to read from our origin, i.e. our S3 bucket. Now the mechanism, um, and this is just you know, kind of low level detail, but uh, the mechanism to achieve that is to create a third type of resource called a an origin access identity. So an origin access identity, it's like an IAM uh, role if you like, but it's specifically linked to the CloudFront service. So you create an origin access identity and then you give that origin access identity the necessary permissions uh, to your S3 bucket, which in our case would typically be just a read uh, read permission. Although if you're supporting ingress, it would be read and write permission. Uh, origin access identity admittedly is a sort of a legacy name. Uh, what you might come across if you read about this stuff is something called an origin access control or OAC. An OAC is the same as an OAI. It's just a slightly newer version of it. Uh, so that's what I'm actually showing you here. Right? The, the access to this bucket is protected by, it's only available to the requester that has the OAI associated with the bucket, if you like. And the only type of resource that can gain that OAI is a CloudFront distribution. <laughs> Demo time, right. Uh, we want to provision, okay, so the objective is provision a cloud distribution of the movies React app using S3 as the origin. Okay, surprise, surprise. That brings me on to a different project which is this one. Now, there's a lot going on in this project, and there's a lot more than what we need to know about right now, but by the end of the lecture, everything in this project is going to be uh, of relevance to you in relation to the assignment. But I'm just gonna focus in on the parts that we're interested in right now, which is we want to create a CloudFront distribution for our React app, we're not interested in any backend now, in any AWS backend. Uh, create a CloudFront distribution for our React app. Store our React app in our S3 bucket, which we know how to do. Upload our React app to our S3 bucket, which we know how to do. But then link our CloudFront distribution to that origin, to that bucket. Right? And where, uh, even though there's a lot going on here now, I'll just focus in on one file. Uh, which is uh, this one here. So let's step through it. And some parts of it uh, we can kind of ignore. We can ignore that line for now. It's not important for right now. Here's our S3 bucket, uh, which we've seen already. I've purposefully left, left these two lines here 
but I've commented them out. And the reason I, I did that is to reinforce a point that I want to make, which is we are using S3 here just as a storage place for objects. We're not using S3 as a host for a web app or a website. It's just a, an, a source for files. Okay, our files happen to be uh, React app-related files, but it's just files. So I've commented them out to remind ourselves that it's just an ordinary S3 bucket. Uh, it's important though as well, though, that, uh, you know, we've blocked off public access, which is good from a security point of view. Okay, I've given the bucket a particular name just to, to help me really, but um, that's not important. You can give it, you, you can leave out bucket name and let the S3 service auto generate a uh, auto generate an, a, a, a name for the bucket so that's not important and the rest is okay so it's just an ordinary s3 bucket uh, here is the origin access identity this special resource that we need to create uh, which our cloudfront distribution will use uh, to give it permissions to to access the bucket so it's a it's a it's an abstract kind of resource right now. Although what's interesting is this line here, right? I'm giving this OAI resource that I've just created, I'm giving it read access, granting it read access to my bucket, okay? Uh, so it looks like this OAI resource is the only thing so far anyway from my code. Uh, and in fact, uh, it will be the only entity that can read from my bucket. And Here's where I create my uh, my content delivery network, or in the in the words of, in the terms of um, AWS CloudFront, I'm creating creating a distribution. And most of the configuration is, you know, fairly understandable. There are bits of it though that we should ignore right now, as in that line here, the certificate is not relevant right now. That becomes relevant later on. Uh, the default object, uh, in my case, is going to be index.html. That means if a user sends a request, but by the way, behind the scenes, when, when this distribution is created, what CloudFront will do is create a, a URL, essentially, for the distribution, a single URL. And if a browser uh, requests that single URL without specifying as particular file, then I'm seeing here by default, serve the index.html file. And that's relevant for us, obviously, because our bucket is hosting a React app. So we want the index.html to be sent down to the browser. And of course, the index.html we've seen, it's going to have a reference to the bundle JavaScript file, which is also going to be in the uh, in my S3 bucket but it will be accessed via the distribution. What else? Um, this line here is not relevant right now. And the rest, I think all we're saying here is, look, we're only supporting um, uh, HTTPS requests. Okay, we're not, we're not uh, honoring HTTP requests. So just a security issue again. The default behavior, this is where we're kind of linking our distribution up with the origin. Um, you can actually have a single CloudFront distribution that is linked to more than one origin. And if that were the case, then we would have to describe how we want the distribution to behave uh, depending on the request that it receives. Uh, because some requests that it receives may be linked with one of my origins, whereas other requests may be linked to another one of the origins. And so in our in this behavior part of the CloudFront uh, configuration is how we describe all of that stuff. But because we have only got one origin, our S3 bucket, then all we need to configure is what uh, CloudFront distribution calls the default behavior. And, you know, you can kind of work out that what we're saying here is we're, we're linking it to our, 
um, we're linking it to our S3, where we're saying that the origin is of type S3, and we're pointing it at our bucket. And we're also telling it about the OAI, the origin access identity that has the necessary permissions to read from that bucket. Uh, compression is just saying we're allowing the S3 service to compress any files before it sends it to the uh, before it sends it to the edge location server that may be sending the request and the edge location server will uncompress them before it caches them and this is saying that if my edge location server receives a HTTP request then it just should redirect it to a HTTPS again from a security oh sorry no Incorrect. Sorry, beg your pardon. Uh, this is telling the CloudFront service what type of requests my distribution supports, and it looks like I'm only accepting GET requests, HEAD requests, and HTTP option requests because cores will be an issue behind the scenes in all of this, and we know that the options request is used for, as the pre-flight request in a cores scenario. Uh, this property here is essentially saying that any HTTP requests that are received from a client will be redirected to HTTPS. So I don't think there's a whole lot really um, of difficulty there. And as before, we need to, sorry, what are we doing here? No, that's, this is irrelevant. Uh, and we've seen this, sorry, this is also irrelevant for now. And we've seen this before. This is where we just upload some content to the bucket. So in summary, if we want to have a cloud front distribution fronting an S3 bucket, we need to create our ordinary bucket. We need to create uh, an object access identity resource. We need to give that resource read permissions on the bucket. We need to create our uh, CloudFront distribution. And finally, we need to uh, uh, we need to provision the code to upload content to the bucket. So that's four uh, resources from a CDK point of view, I suppose. And I'm just outputting the I'm outputting the distributions. I'm saying it's the domain -y name here, but it's the distributions URL essentially. Now I have deployed. Now I know there's a lots of other stuff in this stack. In fact, uh, you know there are actually two stacks, but we can kind of conveniently ignore all of that for now. I have deployed this already, and that will mean uh, if I switch over to Uh, AWS and go to the CloudFront service. Here's the CloudFront uh, instance. And here's the Sorry, I called the URL. Well, yeah, here's the domain name or URL that it has attached or, or generated for my CloudFront service. And that means any user in any part of the globe that issues a request from their browser using this URL, that will, first of all, hit the closest CloudFront uh, edge server to them. It will check the cache to see if it has, in our case, the index.html uh, for this particular uh, CDN. And if it has, then it will serve that index.html to that local user's browser. And it will contain a reference to the JavaScript file. And then the browser will now request the JavaScript file, which more than likely is in the cache as well. And it will be served to the user. So there's no communication with the S3 bucket. Of course, if it's not in the cache, 
then it, it does go back to the bucket. So if I copy this into a browser tab, that's the settings it won't work. Okay, I get my um, I get my React app served to me. I'll just pause in case there are any questions. No, uh, what I'm showing you here is um, I wanted to try and prove to myself and GE that uh, there is an edge location server active here. Now, the only way I can really prove it, uh, it's not proof really, but it's kind of one step towards proving it, is to check to see if there was any hashing happening uh, behind the scenes. Like, did, did CloudFront did the CloudFront uh, location server serve me this content or did it come from S3? And so what I did was I opened up the developer tools, go to the um, go to the network tab, find the uh, reference to the bundle JavaScript file, which I've highlighted here, and then look at the response headers uh associated with the response that came from the cloudfront server and i picked out one prop one one res, uh, response header http response header which was this one here and what it's telling me is that the cloudfront location server uh, did not find the contents that was requested by the browser in its cache, in other words, there was a cache miss. That's what it's telling me there from that entry. So it did actually have to go back to the S3 bucket in order to find that content for that particular request. And surprise, surprise, you know, that was the first request that I issued once I had deployed my uh, my stack that I've just shown you. But when I refreshed the browser, I think I had to refresh it maybe twice and then check the exact same response header then it's now telling me that it was a hit from CloudFront. Now, you know, let's assume that we're not being, uh, that this is true to form, right? That this is actually telling now telling me that uh, the CloudFront edge location server uh, is active here and it is using its cache uh, as we would expect to deliver the content. So if I guess if I open up, uh, I'm sure you get the point, but I'm going to the network side, do a manual refresh. Yeah. Looks like it was a hit again. And what you can actually do, like when you're doing development using CloudFront, uh, something that you might like to be able to do is to uh, flush the caches in the uh, in the edge location servers. And the way you can actually do that, uh, CloudFront allows you to perform what's called an invalidation of your cache. And if we go over to this part here, again, this is kind of a, 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 a would be quite quite low level fine tuning, which he certainly won't be going into. But um, can I remember how to do it?
So I'm creating a new, I'm creating a new invalidation, the existing invalidation, which was automatically created for me as part of the provisioning, uh, the invalid, the, the default invalidation is kind of saying here to flush everything from the cache. You can be specific about maybe certain parts of the cache that you want invalidated, but I want to invalidate everything. So if I create this invalidation, what happens behind the scenes is the uh, CloudFront service will issue a request to its various edge location servers to flush the related cache. Uh, so that's that's happening right now. So if I let that go to completion, and then if I refresh the page in my browser, I should get a cache miss because my caches have been flushed. Hopefully it doesn't take too long. I don't see necessarily doing any of this uh, in relation to the assignment, but uh, it's just a nice to know. So that looks as if it's completed. And I'll go back to, so all of my edge location servers have been, uh, their caches have been flushed. And if I do a refresh, it doesn't make a mockery of what I've just said. Yeah, so I get a a miss a miss from CloudFront. So it did actually have to go back to the S3 bucket. Now because I'm in the EU West region and my stack was deployed in the EU um, West One region and my S3 bucket is in this region and the CloudFront server is in this region. There's there's little difference between hashing it locally, um, but because if we actually looked at the timing, the reason I'm saying that is that the first thing I did was look at, at the timing um, between a cache miss and a cache hit. And by timing, I mean uh, the timings here, yeah. What I found was that it was nearly taking as long when there was a cache hit as it was with a cache miss. And that shouldn't be the case. The timing to download should be a lot shorter when it's a cache hit, but it turns out that it wasn't. And that's really because everything is in the one region and in the one, um, in the one region. Yeah. I don't know if that makes, uh, if I've made sense by what I just said there. Okay. Let's move on. Just some theory. I know now caching is something that Frank actually covered in his discussion on React. So the, the concept of a cache, if I'm sure it was uh, familiar to you anyway before that, but the content, uh, a cache is simply a high performance, low latency key value store. Um, and so that's the same in the case of a CloudFront cache. The keys, um, the keys, let's see what else am I saying here? The, the, Oh yeah, the cache keys are also something that you can uh, you can control from the CloudFront distribution configuration, which we won't get into, uh, but you can. And I'm mentioning invalidations here and what the role of invalidations are. Um, again, from a, just from a theory point of view, from in in relation to CloudFront cache keys, the default is that the key is determined from the host name and the resource name of the particular uh, content file that the client or browser requested. So in our case, that would be, I go back to here. You know, uh, this is the host name, obviously. And the there are only two files, as it turns out, index.html and the JavaScript file. So they would be the two resources. But more generally, uh, you'd obviously have a larger, um, 
a larger set of files that are cacheable. That's the default behavior. Um, we have a location that serves up content. Oh yeah, in, in more generally, maybe the content that is delivered to your to your user, to your client, maybe it's actually not only is it just the host name plus the resource name, but maybe the content that's delivered is determined from the type of device that they're using, the natural language that the user's browser is configured to, um, or maybe whether the user is authenticated or not. So there are lots of other attributes associated with the request. Those attributes may be specified in the form of HTTP request headers or in a query string or in cookies that are sent with the request. And if that is the case, then you can actually use, you can configure your CloudFront distribution to include those other attributes of the request as part of the cache key. Yeah, um, so that flexibility is, and you do, you configure it using, uh, surprise, surprise, what are called cache key policies that you configure in your CloudFront distribution. There are two types of policies. I am really only covering this for kind of completeness rather than uh, related to the assignment. There are two types of policies. There's what's called the caching policy and something called the origin request policy. Caching policy is essentially what I've been talking about up to now. So uh, you can, so the caching policy is about how you want the cache key to be um, constructed. Um, so as well as just the host name and the resource name, you can specify that I want, that you want special certain HTTP request headers included in the cache key, certain cookies included, their key and their value, certain query strings included, their key and their value. The origin request policy associated with a distribution, what that relates to is, so let's supposing we have a situation where a client sends a request to an edge location, a CloudFront edge location server, and there is a cache miss, which means the server must now forward the request back to the origin. Well, what should it include in that request? What HTTP headers should it include? What query string should it include? What cookies should it include? Of those that it has received from the client. So the client may have a number of HTTP headers, number of cookies, number of query strings. Should some or all of those be included in the request that is sent from the edge location server back to the origin. And you can configure that. And that is what is referred to as the origin request policy of your distribution. Uh, this is a nice kind of visual representation of it, which you can study later on yourselves. Cache and validation I've spoken about. Now, if I go back to my agenda, uh, so we've ticked off all of this now at this stage, and this, of course. Next to me, we move on to integrating our front end and our back end, which we might refer to collectively as we want to be able to deploy a full stack web app comprised of a front end and a back end. And we know how to deploy the back end. We did that in assignment one. I've shown you how to deploy the front end. But the tricky part is how we tell the front end what are the URLs of the back end restful um, endpoint or endpoints. And how can we configure it in a kind of dynamic way rather than hard coding? the backend API URLs in our React code. We'd like to be able to do it dynamically. By dynamically, I mean at deployment time. And 
that's the next focus that I want to look at in the code. Now, uh, if you just give me one moment. These are just notes that I've made for myself, really. Uh, so. Right. So we now need to go into, maybe if I now step back and take a deeper look into this actual project that I will be making available to you uh, via GitHub repo. So let's look at the app file. Turns out that this is a multi-stack app. Uh, there are two stacks. There is this one and this one. For now, we can ignore the one that I've just highlighted. Uh, this is the one that we're interested in right now. And for now, we can also ignore all of this stuff here. Okay. So we're focusing in on this stack, which is implemented. Well, sorry, we can see in the lib folder, I have a constructs folder. I've defined three um, custom constructs for myself. That's constructs in the CDK sense, the L1, L2, L3 constructs. So these are three custom L2 constructs. We've kind of essentially looked at the front end construct already. These two constructs here uh, are very similar, if not uh, in, in structure anyway, to what you created for assignment one. For example, I have an auth API TS file. And that, if we look inside it, is a construct that creates a RESTful um, backend that mainly deals with authentication. Uh, and so, yeah, let's just quickly browse through it. In fact, it's the it's almost a copy and paste. It is a copy and paste of the Cognito project that I discussed with G a number of weeks ago. Yeah, so I'm creating my uh, API gateway instance and configuring cores, and I am creating adding a number of resources to my uh, to my uh, API gateway restful backend as in there is a sign up confirm sign up sign in sign out all of what we all of which we've seen before so there's nothing new there in this construct this is my app api now i've scaled it right down to just a kind of demo uh, implementation so i've got a simple lambda uh, if, sorry, sorry for now for jumping around, but if I look at my Lambdas folder, I have an auth subfolder and it has all of those. These are individual Lambdas, which are the exact same as the Lambdas that we talked about when we were discussing Cognito. So that subfolder has nothing new in it. Uh, I've only got, in terms of my app API, as opposed to my auth API, I only have one Lambda, which is this demo Lambda here, and it doesn't do anything interesting. Okay, kept it simple. Just returns a simple success message. The RESTful API associated with that is constructed here. Okay, so I refer to my demo Lambda function, create my RESTful API, and add a resource to it. So my resource... I have uh, is the to do's resource. Okay, so if the use if a client if this API gateway receives a request to the to do's resource, then that will trigger the running of my simple little lambda function. 
Okay, uh, so that's fine. And the front end construct. So we now have a sense of these three constructs, what each of them provisions from a CDK point of view. I also have a stacks file and it has two stacks. We are not interested in this stack uh, at the moment. This is the stack that we're interested in. And what this stack will do is it will uh, it will provision my two RESTful APIs, the Auth API and the App API, and it will also provision my uh, CloudFront distribution, my S3 bucket origin, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it provisions all of the uh, CloudFront resources. Now, the only missing part of the jigsaw, though, is how do we connect up the back end with the front end? Uh, so maybe just before I talk about that, let's just uh, step through this file. This is my full stack stack file. And I create my uh, Cognito user pool as before. I create a Cognito client as before. I create an instance of my uh, I create an instance of my art API. This is my this is my custom resource, this art uh, resource that I was just uh, construct that I was talking about. Create an instance of that, pass in the user pool stuff to it, which we've kind of seen before. I create an instance of my app API which is just a, uh, a skeleton, really. And I create an instance of my front-end construct, which does the S3 and CloudFront distribution stuff. Uh, for now, we can... Well, sorry. Um, the next thing I'm passing in here to that construct, these two properties, which is the URL of my auth API and my app API. There's nothing new that in that though. I'm just passing in props to a local construct. And how do I extract those two URLs from the APIs? Well, if I look, let's say, at the auth API, and if I scroll up to the top of it, again, some of you will be familiar with this if you used custom constructs in the first assignment, but uh, let's see here. If you create a, a read-only property of your construct class, and in my case, I'm creating one, the other ones are properties that are being passed in. So a, a private read, sorry, a public read only property is essentially a property that you want to make available to the rest of your CDK code. So I've created uh, one of just of type string and I've called that variable uh, API URL. And where I initialize that variable and initialize it anywhere in your, in this file, though, but I do it, it tends to be done at the end. Sorry, at the end, which is, Here, I'm essentially just picking up the URL from the RESTful API that I've created uh, up at the top of this code. Okay, so that's how I export, if you like, a piece of data from one construct and I pass it into another construct. In my case, I'm passing in this value into the front end construct. That's what I was doing. That's what I was doing here. Okay, and passing it in. And I'm doing the same with the app API's URL. So if we look inside in the front end construct next, so it turns out that this custom construct of mine has got some custom properties, really. 
And how do I declare that? Uh, well, I've declared an interface here, just a type for myself, that has my two values. Now, the other two values we can ignore for now because there are some other uh, properties that I need to pass into it as well, but they're not relevant right now. And in my construct declaration, in its constructor, I'm saying that the constructor, the constructor, its props argument is of type, the type that I've just declared. Okay, so that now means that this construct of mine, it has the URLs of the two RESTful web APIs uh, available to it. Now, the next thing though is, how do we actually make those available to our deployed React app? And this is the part that uh, we need to focus in on. So if I scroll down to here, I'm just creating a local uh, object for myself, which I've called this. And the object contains the two URLs that I've just been talking about. Now, this is a completely custom construct. This has got nothing to do with, um, this isn't adhering to any CDK predefined type. This is just a uh, an object, JavaScript object, really. I, I haven't even given it a type. I should probably have created a custom type for it, uh, but just a little bit lazy, okay? So I'm creating that object. And what I want to do is, I want to upload that object to the same S3 bucket that contains my React app. That's going to be the first part of how I integrate my front end and my back end. So the first part is I want to upload this object uh, to my S3 bucket. Well, this is how I upload stuff to my S3 bucket. And when you're uploading uh, using this bucket deployment um, construct provided by the CDK, the, the sources property here you'll see is an array. So you can upload as many things as you want to. This is uploading the React app itself, which is contained inside in the side folder. This is where I upload essentially the object that I've just shown you there. And I'm telling it to upload it and also give it the key config.json which really means it's gonna appear as a JSON file in my S3 bucket. And I've already deployed this stack and I can show you if I go over to uh, AWS and I go into S3. Now, for convenience, um, I gave, uh, if I go back to here, sorry. I, well, uh, I gave the bucket a specific name just for convenience for me, but that's not uh, important. And the name happens to be the same as the uh, custom domain name that I've used there. So, you know, if I go movies, I think. Okay, here's my bucket, which, as I said, happens to have a name that is linked to the custom domain name, but that is uh, of no significance whatsoever. But if I go into the bucket, uh, surprise, surprise, it has a file called, um, it has a file called, or does it? Oh yeah, there we go, config.json. And of course, of less of a surprise, it has the index.html related to my React app. It has the assets folder. And if we dig down into the assets folder, it has the that bundled JavaScript file, all from we talked about uh, earlier on. So we have this file in the same bucket um, called config.json. 
and it has what I just told you uh, it contains. We can open it up, but uh, take my word for it. It has that JSON structure um, that I talked about. Now, the next thing is, though, uh, how does our React app uh, get at this file? And it's pretty straightforward, really. The React app just seems simply needs to, as part of its uh, own kind of boot up process, it needs to read that file. And now, certainly, it has the URLs of our custom RESTful APIs. So if I switch over to React, our React app, Now, I just want to undo some stuff here first. So there's a couple of steps that you have to do on the React side. Uh, first of all, you... But this is just the way that I did it, right? So you, you, if you create a file called uh, cost config.js, the name is not significant. You can call it something else if you want to. And there I have a piece of code. And the very first line is significant. I'm doing a fetch of dot slash config.json. Of course, the dot slash means it's in the same location as this file that we're looking at. But of course, this file is going to be our index.html effectively. Okay. It's the base location of where all of this stuff came from. So that that line that I've highlighted is effectively going to read the config.json from our uh, S3 bucket, or more specifically from the cache of the local uh, CloudFront. Edge location server. We don't have to worry about that. Though. Either way, it gets the it's downloaded the contents of that JSON file to to the React app itself, which is currently running inside the browser. And all I'm doing here then is I'm just just collapse that. I'm just creating a a data structure for myself. the The structure of this data structure is not significant, but I'm just storing. I'm extracting the actual URLs from the file that I've downloaded. Okay, I'm attaching, I'm assigning this config variable to the contents of that file. So config now is essentially, uh, it's essentially referring to a data structure. That looks like that. And in fact, I could have just left it like that right? uh, on the React side, but I think I must have been influenced by the article that I read. All I'm doing, all I'm doing uh, here is I'm just creating a local, slightly more elaborate data structure and putting the two URLs into this data structure here and here. Okay. So that's fine. I now have my two URLs, but supposing I want to actually send a, uh, make a HTTP request to these two backends. Well, the code to do that, you already know how to do it. It would involve using the use effect hook in React, uh, but I follow through this. And so what I've done is in the TMDB, probably shouldn't have put it in there. I probably should have created a separate, uh, because the, this file name suggests that this contains TMDB stuff, but I've actually put in requests uh, to my custom, uh, to my custom uh, web APIs. But let's see, I'm simply importing the data structure that I just showed you there a moment ago from the config.js file. Try and keep both of those files open. I appreciate now that uh, there's quite a lot of juggling going on here. So let's just keep that file open. And let's close that off. 
So in the TMDB API file, um, I'm importing that structure, which was exported, and then I'm making a fetch call to, it looks like in this case, I'm making a fetch call to the uh, the zeroth entry in that structure, the zeroth entry, and to the endpoint property of that zeroth entry, which means I am making a request to, because you can see this is an array here. Um, is it an array? Oh yeah, th there's the array, this is an array. So I'm essentially, making a fetch request to this particular URL, which in my case would be the app URL. And in particular, I'm trying to access the to-dos resource. Remember I created a, the only, the only resource I associated with my app RESTful API was uh, called to do's. So I'm making a HTTP GET request to that. And that's fine. Down here, I'm making a request, a HTTP POST request to essentially the AUT API because endpoint subscript one is my AUT backend and specifically I am trying to access the auth slash sign in endpoint in my auth API. So this is effectively uh, trying to log in, trying to execute a login request to my auth API. Now I have hard coded uh, a username and password, okay, that username, this password, uh, for a reason, just for, for convenience, really. But what I'm doing anyway is I'm making a, a post request to the auth API of my, um, my custom backend uh, hosted on uh, by API Gateway. And where I invoke, so these are two uh, functions and where I invoke these functions again, I've just stuck them into the home page. So if we now look at the home page, I just bluntly have two use effect hooks. here and it looks like this use effect is trying to invoke the get to do's function that I've just been showing you so that should make a HTTP get request to the to do's endpoint of my app API and I just do some console log just to see what it comes back with here I'm making a HTTP POST request to my auth API and specifically to the auth slash sign in endpoint. And I hard coded the username and password, as I said. So this looks like it's trying to simulate doing a, uh, carrying out a login for a particular user. And I'm consoling, console logging what I get back just to see if it worked or not. Now, at the very beginning or towards the beginning of the lecture. Um, so, so these two console logs, hopefully will confirm to me that the requests worked successfully. This console log should show me the response from one of my lambdas, which is, and particularly it should show me the response from Let's just close up that list folder. So the console log that I've highlighted there should show me the response 
from add from this lambda cut that okay you need time to study but that is the lambda that i've linked to the to do's endpoint of my app api so it's just uh, sending back a success uh message yeah and when i at the beginning of the lecture when i went to let's just see now um when i went to movies Uh, this part here, response from app backend. Uh, let's see. Go back to my React app. So it's response from app backend followed by the actual response. Um, the response from uh, from the lambda essentially then that seems to tally with uh, this text here and when I expand that object then you know I'm getting the what am I getting I'm getting the message success but that looks as if it has worked uh, for me uh, the embarrassing thing that I haven't resolved yet is why I'm getting an error here, a 500 internal status error. It looks like that the Lambda is running successfully, and I can show you using CloudWatch logs that the Lambda runs successfully, and it returns a 200 response. Of course, that is sent back to API Gateway, uh, but for some reason that I haven't fully debugged yet, but it's not actually affecting anything. API Gateway seems to be converting that 200 response into a 500 response, but it's still sending me on the body of the response from the Lambda, and that's really all I'm interested in. Okay, now if I was using this data here in my actual UI, then it would show up correctly. Uh, it's only when I open up the console log uh, sorry, it's only when I open up the developer tools that I do see that there is a, a 500. But it, as I said, it's not affecting uh, the user experience, if you like. Uh, that's not a great look for me, but I'll see if I can try and resolve it. But it's not going to impact on, it isn't impacting on the user experience. The other part of here, this uh, response from auth, uh, backend, well, that's coming from the other console.log in my React app, which is this stuff here. And it's also showing the response from my Lambda. The Lambda in this case is the sign-in Lambda, which you would have, you would have written uh, in your first assignment. Just a quick reminder. And in fact, I, you know, I, I gave you that code, if you remember. Okay, that's, let's just close off that because we no longer need it. So if I find the Lambda in question here, which is uh, this one. And uh, if everything is successful, as in the username and password combination is successful, then it returns in the body of the response that it sends back, which is here, right? It sends us back a message with that text, and it sends us back the JWT token. And... That's what I'm getting here. I'm getting the message and I'm getting the JWT token. 
And what's kind of confusing for me is I'm not getting the 500 error uh, in this case, whereas I'm in this case, so that's uh, anyway, that's that's for me to resolve. Uh, and from again, uh, the risk of repeating myself, then I'm, I am getting the response data that I need from the back end in both cases, which means if I want to render those or use that data in the logic of my React app, it's all going to work successfully. Uh, I'll just pause maybe in case there are any questions. I appreciate though there's a lot of juggling going on here. I'm going to make all of this code available to you anyway. No. Um, now, uh, as before, I have a folder called site here. So you still have to and in terms of the assignment, you should have, I, I'm, I'm suggesting you should have two separate projects, if you like. You should have your React project where you're doing all your React development. And when it comes to trying to do the integration part, then build your React app, create a build version or a bundle version of your React app and copy that over into your second project, which is essentially this, right? You can download this from my GitHub repo and use that as your starting point uh, for sh uh, proving that you've got the two, the back end and the front end to integrate. Now, again, it's a bit clunky, but you'll be creating a, you'll have two separate projects folders, as I said, in the React project folder, you'll be creating a build and then copying the contents of the dist folder into the site folder of this project and then doing the deployment. Um, like I said a, a while back, that is, uh, there's a lot of friction there, but, and to, to get away from that, we'd have to create what's called a CICD pipeline using the CDK to do all of that for us, but we're not gonna go near that. Right, uh, let me check my notes. There's still one more step that we need to uh, talk about. Um, now for me, in order to, you know, when I showed you, uh, when I showed you this and, you know, I showed you, look, the, the communication is happening in particular, this one here worked fine. Uh, it worked fine because I already had registered a user in my user pool. Again, if I go back to my react code. And if I go into the this file here, I hard coded uh, the username and uh, password. Yeah. Now, obviously, in your case, you're going to have a simple little web form where the user enters uh, the user credentials, and then it, those can be passed on to this what I'm calling the get tokens. A function so this function is going to need arguments of type um, two strings username and password um but uh what i did obviously was i actually had to create uh what did i call it user a is it i had to create user a in my user pool and i did that via postman and you should do the same so i would um uh, uh, I would suggest don't bother trying to support user registration and user confirmation in your assignment. There, there is really no need for that at all. All you need to prove from an inter from an integration point of view is that you can log in as a user and you can create the users, as I said, using Postman, which is exactly uh, what I did. So if I go to AWS and I go into Cognito,
just realized now that I've run out of time because I need to cover some more stuff with you, but that's okay. Here's my Cognito user pool. And... Uh, there's my user A. Right. I go back to my slides. I obviously talk too much. The so we have I've demonstrated that. What's left is this creating a custom domain and associating that with your React app. Am I reading my watch correctly now? I'm sorry. No, I'm, okay. I've got uh, got about another 20 minutes or so. So let's look at this side, custom domain. Okay, so our objective is to um, use the CDK framework in this case now to allow a custom domain to be associated with our uh, full stack app or with our CloudFront enabled uh, full stack app. So the steps are, there are a couple of steps that you have to carry out manually and then the rest is handled by your CDK code. And what's inside this uh, red box is the CDK stuff. What you've got to do manually and uh, is as follows. Now, there's a, there's a, there's a cost associated with this. So some of you may already have registered a domain name for yourselves or some other um, private or ac academic related stuff that you're doing. Uh, but if you haven't, uh, and I, I don't want to force people to spend money, even though you're not going to be, the cost is quite minimal. We're talking about maybe $10 for a year long use of a domain name. So the first thing you've got to do is buy a domain name for yourself. Now, I've actually bought a domain name a number of years ago. I bought it on the Amazon um, platform itself. So if I go in, in my case, uh, if I go into Route 53, I wouldn't suggest buying your domain name by a AWS though, because it's, um, yeah, again, it's margin, but it is more expensive. Uh, where are registered domains? If I go into registered domains, I have bought uh, dermodoconnor.com, which is why I was able to Deploy my React app to movies.dmrconnor.com. So I've bought that domain. Uh, but you can, there are other domain registries out there. You know, some of you may have uh, used uh, GoDaddy is one. A uh, one that I think is probably the cheapest, kind of got a funny name, but it's a service called porkbun.com. So if you uh, want to buy a custom domain name for yourself, I would recommend going to that website and buying your, I think you can buy a .com. You can actually buy a .ie domain and .org, I think. Um, but have a look anyway, see how much they cost. And if they're, as they're, they're, they're pretty inexpensive. And you can always relinquish the domain uh, after a year, which means you don't keep re, uh, um, incurring the, the, the fairly minimal cost. So step one is buy your own custom domain. Um, you can watch this video if you like. Uh, the video explains the steps in, well, there, there aren't many steps in buying a domain now. It's just a simple transaction, but there is a, a little bit of configuration that you have to do subsequently. So you buy your domain, number one. Number two, in AWS, you have to create a, what's called a hosted zone for your domain. Uh, again, you do this manually. So that brings us back to uh, route 53. And if you click on hosted zones, now I've created a hosted zone. The hosted zone, um, there's very little to creating one. Uh, 
uh, you specify your the domain name so that you have just bought here. And that's it, really. There's nothing else. You can have a description if you want to. Uh, you can have tags if you want to. You don't need any of them. Okay. So just uh, put in your custom domain name in there and click the Create button down at the bottom. And once you've done that, you will now see your hosted zone. Uh, the local hosted zone is a default one. That's always uh, with everybody's account. So leave that there. This is the hosted zone that I have just created uh, or pre-created for myself. And again, as I said, it has the name has to correspond to your custom domain name. If we look inside the hosted zone, I don't know how much Route 53 stuff. I'd imagine you've done quite a bit on Route 53 in the earlier module, but it doesn't matter. I'm not assuming that because uh, some of you haven't done that uh, cloud architecture module. Um, what you do need to do here is initially in this hosted zone, there will be two records, as they're called in the language of Route 53. Uh, there'll be an, uh, an, an NS, a name server record, and an SOA record. And you can just leave those as they are. Now, these other records here are actually going to be added by our CDK code once we've added some other entries to our CDK stack, which I need to talk about. But uh, if we, if you select the, uh, let's see if you select the first one, the NS one, I think. Oh yeah, uh, so I just need to with the uh, name server record. This one here, what root fifty three has done is it has assigned what are called a set of name servers that it owns. Again, this is a bit like the CDN, um, but in in the in the in the domain of uh, domain name registries, it has assigned some name servers to your uh, to your hosted zone. And in my case, it's these ones here. Now you've got to take those name servers and you've got to assign them or allocate, um, attach them to your custom domain domain name on the domain name registry uh, that you have used. In my case, because I've registered my domain uh, on AWS, then I would associate these name servers with my domain name in my AWS domain name registry. And that may, brings me back to here. Here's the registry in my case. In your case, it would be pork bun if you use pork bun to register your domain name or GoDaddy. Uh, and if I go into my the my domain name registry entry, then uh, you can see I have I've already done it right. These are the name servers that were assigned uh, to me by Route Fifty Three for my hosted zone. In the case of um, uh, in the case, in my case, I just went in here and did edit name servers and I added the servers individually. Now that's, that's what I did because, sorry, now for repeating myself, but because I bought my domain name, uh, on AWS, uh, you will have to do this. You'll take the name servers from your hosted zone, but you will add them to your registered domain name on the particular uh, registry platform that you used. And in the slides, for example, if you watch this video, uh, the person explains how you do it for Pork Bun, for example. Again, it's a fairly straightforward step. Okay, so that's step two we have done. We've created our, we've, we've bought our domain name. We have registered our name servers uh, for our hosted zone. Number three, uh, well, number three is copying the the what I've just been talking about there. That's step step three. Step four then brings us back to the CDK stack.
Now, at the outset, I said that this CDK app is comprised of two stacks. And uh, the second stack now is relevant. This stack, its purpose is uh, to create a certificate for my domain name. Clearly, I want all of the com uh, communication with my um, with my uh, full stack app. I want it to be over HTTPS. I want it to be secure uh, communication. So I need to create a certificate for my domain name, or more particularly for my subdomain, because I've decided I'm going to use the subdomain movies.dearmaracano.com uh, as being the full URL for my uh, React app. So I need to create a uh, a, a certificate for that subdomain name. Uh, now, to do that on the AWS platform, you, you could actually get your own domain registry like Port One or Go, GoDaddy. You could use them to create a certificate and then import that certificate into your CDK stack. Uh, but I would recommend doing it the way that I'm doing it here, which is to create the certificate using the AWS platform itself. The service that we want to use to do that is a service called the uh, ACM, the Amazon Certificate Manager. The thing about the Amazon Certificate Manager service is that it only works on the US East 1 region, which is why I'm passing that region to this stack. And I'm also passing it my account number. Now, where does this come from? This is another thing that you have to do uh, for this part of the application. You've got to, well, in my case, I've, uh, I've created a file called env.ts. And I have essentially uh, initialized some variables in there. And they're all fairly obvious. One is contains, uh, is assigned my, my uh, the region that I want to deploy the rest of my CDK app to, that is my, my, my S3 bucket and my CloudFront distribution, et cetera, et cetera. My account number, the ID of the hosted zone that I've created, where you get the ID from is, I think I'm gonna get to complete all of this now. Where am I? No, I'm out of time. Sorry, I've gone over overtime actually. Okay, I'm gonna to have to pick up this. I was hoping to complete this today, but uh, didn't manage to achieve that. I'm gonna to have to complete this uh, part the next day. That's probably about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, I don't think Frank is gonna need uh, a full two hours anyway, but I'll, I'll chat with him about it. So I will uh, complete this stuff the next day and uh, then you'll have all the information that you need for, did I get to bring up the assignment spec? Um, we did the custom domain name part of this stack that I'm looking at is only relevant to the very top grade in that grading spectrum that Frank has provided for assignment two. In other words, the, the 90 plus um, grade part of the spectrum. You won't need the custom domain name otherwise. But I'd like to cover a witchy anyway, so I'll do that the next day. And apologies for going way over time. Uh, I lost track of the clock. Okay. Um, I don't know if you're still there or not, but I will sign out. And I'll hang on for any questions, if there are any questions, for sure. But otherwise, I'll terminate the lecture here.